All right. Welcome to the Ward 4 Town Hall. Uh, I'm Robert Deming, I'm your councilman. Thank you guys for coming. I know that uh, the ward lines changed. Not everyone was aware of that. And, and unfortunately, the, G the GIS systems weren't updated. So invitations didn't go out to our new set, to our new um, areas. Now, if, you, if you're familiar with the new ward lines, they're very similar to the old ward lines, although we've added some areas. We lost a little bit, but added a whole bunch more. Um, I'm glad to have you guys still in the ward, happy to represent you, and I look forward to continuing to represent you within the new ward lines. Tonight, I just wanted to give you a few updates on what's going on. Because of the GIS um, delay, we'll, we'll be having another town hall in just a few months, so we can make sure that mail-outs go to all of those new residents within the ward, and we'll do this again. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the, the, the bridge updates, and I know there were a lot of people that called me and asked me about the bridge. Um, if there's any questions about the bridge, I'd love to hear them now. Right now, the issue has basically been resolved. There won't be a toll bridge. We've passed on that option. Um, we are moving towards a rehabilitation process. We're going to spend some money to fix, repair, and upgrade the mechanisms on the current bridge. So that's, that put a lot of people's mind at ease. Um, secondly, Drainage. Drainage is a huge issue, and I've been following up on some of the issues that we found during the during the campaign. And there are a lot of things that haven't been addressed yet with public works, of course, manpower, economy, COVID, all that stuff. All excuses aside, we are making sure that I'm following up on those and making sure that we're addressing them. So those those issues, if they have not been addressed, that were on my list, will be addressed along with more. Now, some direct updates. Um, I know. Some of you that live in the Club Moss Circle area, I've met with some of the residents there, and especially one resident who, who is a, a great ambassador for your neighborhood. And we found some areas that we can, we can um, modify and upgrade with some engineering to remove some rainwater faster so your drainage works a little better. Now we have the, the administration who's not here tonight, unfortunately. Um, but we'll be able to get another update from them in just a couple months when they are out here. They are, they've sent the engineers out there to, to assess the situation, and I think it's a, it's a very optimistic outlook for that area. Now, another part of, of drainage is, is runoff from other areas, so we are looking at a bond effort that will help us refinance some of the bonds that we have at a much lower rate. Right now, buying money has never been cheaper, and so we're going to refinance this. It won't be an increase in debt servicing for the city at all. Um, it'll be feasible and, 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 and uh, financially sufficient to, to redo some of the parks and, and some drainage and some roads. And doing some of this stuff is, is really directed to drainage and runoff into these neighborhoods so we can help assist the removal of that water at a faster rate, which will benefit all of us. Um, I'm going to let a couple of the, the uh, representatives here tonight give you some updates about their respective departments and then we'll do a Q&A session after that. Um, Jamie Lee is, is the assistant to Ms. Bell who is the director of, public, of uh, Parks and Recs. He's going to give us a little update regarding what we have going on, the events that are taking place in Biloxi and what we can expect. Hello everyone. Um, as Councilman Demick said, you know some of the things we're looking at uh, with the Pops Ferry Fields, just looking at a, some improvement there and just continuing to work on the pickleball facility that we have um, on Pops Ferry. It is, we had our senior games out there for the state organization last week and it was just, it was a wonderful turnout with over 200 participants came in from all over the area. So uh, we're really excited and looking at some different options um, out there at those pickleball courts. So. Um, you know, if you have any other questions for Councilman Deming, just uh, let us know. So, but thank you so much. Thank you, Jeremy. Now, what's exciting, when I talk to some of the organizations and the pickleball groups, as we move forward and we expand on our pickleball um, facility, we've got some pickleball courts in other areas of the city now, Hiller Park, there's going to be some at Eagle Point. But we're going to be able to, fill, to facilitate some, some national tournaments, bringing a lot of new people into Biloxi, which, of course, brings a lot of money in and helps us finance a lot of the repairs and renovations that we need. Uh, we talk about this every meeting and in every town hall 
about the, the infrastructure for West Biloxi. It's the oldest infrastructure left in the city that hasn't been updated and it desperately needs to be. I know if the administration was here, they would tell you about, about our long-term plan to address the infrastructure here in Biloxi. But I've got Mr. Creel here, who is the director of, of uh, community development. He's gonna give us an update on what we've got going on in the city. Hello. We have, uh, we have a number of things going on in the city. Uh, uh, really a lot of projects that are happening right now. I'll, I'll run through some of them just to kind of give you an update. Um, of course, we're Universal Music. Everyone's wanting to know what's happening with the Broadwater. We're essentially waiting on them. Um, I've talked with the, the developers who are putting that together, and uh, they said that it's still moving forward, but they haven't submitted anything to us yet. But uh, that's going to be a really big project, not just for this area, but also for uh, for the city of Biloxi, Margaritaville. Uh, you've probably read about their expansion. They're going to be not only expanding on the site that they're on, but they're also going to be expanding across Highway 90 and, uh, and have a big amusement area over on that side as well. Uh, the renovations are continuing on the old Josette's building downtown to create some residential units there. They're also building a new location for Philip with Billups right next door. So if you wondered what that building is right beside it, that's what that's going to be is that that restaurant that right now is across from Beau Rivage will be moving up there. Uh, we recently opened Ground Zero downtown. Demolition work has started on the large bark building at the corner of Howard and Raynor. And you know that's going to be uh, commercial on the bottom floor and they'll have residential above. They're also going to be adding a certain section of a third floor uh, up above that that would also have some residential units in it which is something we've been trying to do for a long time. The old Wells Fargo building downtown is going to be converting to condos. They're actually painting the outside right now. They still have to go through our process but that's going to be moving forward. We have new owners for both the Edgewater Square shopping center down the road here where Harbor Freight Tools and Hobby Lobby are and also the same developers have bought the old Winn-Dixie shopping center on this end of Pass Road, down this direction, and they have some big plans for both of those that we'll be announcing later. Um, community Bank has finished downtown except for a couple of minor things, the new main branch of Community Bank. The Sanger Theater renovations uh, are continuing. We have um, uh, Arbor Landing Apartments is doing phase two right now, which is gonna add a number of units to that. That's next to the Walmart neighborhood market on Pops Ferry Road, and now they've gotten approval to do phase three, which is directly behind uh, Walmart neighborhood market. So that'll be starting very soon. Um, there's a new climate controlled RV storage that's gonna be going in on Tommy Monroe Road. We've just opened a new climate control storage on Pops Ferry Road. The um, uh, B&G climate control storage, also on Tommy Monroe, is doing an expansion across the street. We've got a new apartment complex coming in at 133 Briarfield, which is an apartment complex where they've uh, gotten a zoning change approval so that they can do short-term rental out of those units. The old uh, Reading House downtown has been bought by the Rizzuto family, which is a very successful restaurant family in New Orleans, and we're waiting on them to submit plans to us for the changes they're gonna make to that building. On the former Breakers Inn property down on Highway 90 at Grandview, that property has been bought by Elliott Homes and they're gonna turn that into a single family subdivision. It'll have 39 lots in it and you'll see construction start on that very quickly. Uh, we have a new subdivision going in on Shriners Boulevard. It's called the Preserve. That's gonna add another 209 lots to our inventory of homes. Uh, in Ward 4, we have uh, Bertusi Park, which uh, was in Ward 3, but is now in Ward 4 under the new ward changes, and, uh, and, and that's going to be moving forward. You'll probably see a, a, a submission for a subdivision for some houses to be built there, 16 large lot subdivisions. Also, we've, uh, we have a new subdivision going in on Causeway Park at Barrett Road. That's where the old mobile home park was. Uh, the mobile home park is being removed, and they're going to be building uh, nine new single family lots in there, large size lots. We also have a Jeep dealership that's gonna be going in at the corner of 
Pops Ferry Road and T Street, and you've probably seen where they've spread the dirt there right now to get that started. Uh, it'll be a different type of dealership where uh, there will be no cars outside, they'll all be inside, and you basically go in and place your order, and then they have it shipped to your, your home. Uh, we continue to get questions about the property right next to T Street, which is on Camp Wilkes Road, which is vacant right now. We have subdivision developers that are looking at that property. We also have subdivision developers that continue to ask us about the, the Camp Wilkes property that's been used by the Boy Scouts for years to develop that into a single family subdivision. We have a new restaurant going in at the corner of Cedar Lake and Pops Ferry. It's called Slim Chickens and I'm told that it's very, very popular. We also have a developer that's going to be building some townhomes on Kivet Street. They purchased that property from the city. Um, the um, White House Hotel uh, has uh, is going to be presenting plans to expand the White House Hotel over to the west side of White Avenue. Uh, they've done a design that looks a lot like uh, the White House Hotel architecture. Uh, it will also have an event center in there in addition to having uh, a number of uh, hotel rooms. So that will be coming forward very soon. You probably read recently about the proposal for the two hotels on uh, Beach Boulevard that will be just west of that White House property. That will be going to the City Council for consideration on uh, April the 19th. There's another Elliott Homes project in East Biloxi uh, where they're looking at some land there to build some single family homes. Um, a developer that uh, is uh, a couple of guys that partnered together, one was an engineer, one was a real estate developer, uh, Andy Phelan and Kenneth Jones. They have a large townhome project going in on Eula Street. Actually, they have two uh, townhome projects going in on Eula Street, which is off of DeBees Road. They also have a development going that's going to be going in on Beach Boulevard in front of the Seashore Oaks uh, project uh, townhomes that are there now. Uh, we're talking with a new owner about the former La property where La Quinta was going to go. There's a, a new buyer that's that's close to closing a deal to buy that property. He's a hotel developer, so we'll probably see a hotel coming back to that. Also, you probably read about the, the new houses that are going to be built on south of Highway 90 and just west of the Shell Station. That should be moving forward fairly quickly. Uh, the go-kart track on Highway 90 is adding a zip line, so if any of y'all are interested in that, uh, that'll, that'll be opening very soon. Uh, and also, um, single family residential is just off the chart. You know, one of the things that we look for as a community development department and as a city is are we getting development in all of the main areas? Are we getting single family development? Are we getting multifamily development? Are we getting commercial development? Are we getting amusement? And the answer to all four of those is yes, we're getting development in all of those areas, which is a very good sign for us. Not only that, We've just had the 11th month, 11th month in a year where our sales tax revenues has exceeded $1 million. That's never happened in the history of Biloxi. Also, casino revenues continue to be off the chart. Um, some of the other things that we're doing in, in our department, of course, we participate in the uh, National Flood Insurance Program's community rating system. Uh, where we get uh, awarded points for all the efforts that we're making to reduce the risk of flood damage in the event that we have another event, and, and certainly we will have another event. But Biloxi has the best flood rating in the state. We're the only five on a scale of one to ten. So right now, as a result of that, if you have a flood insurance policy and you live in the flood zone, you should be getting a 25% discount on your flood insurance premiums because of that rating that we have. Also, if you have building insurance, uh, depending on when your, your structure was built, you should be getting a 4% discount on your building insurance because we have a, a building department rating of four, which is one of the best in the state. The, the criteria for, uh, and let me back up a little bit. If you have a flood insurance policy and you live outside the flood zone, you should be getting a 10% discount on your flood insurance. So you need to check with your insurance agent on that. Um, we, uh, 
we continue to take steps to, to do everything we can to save the taxpayers money. Uh, the more development we can bring in, you know, the more revenues we build in and cities operate off revenues. So this is one of the reasons that we try to fight for good, good development projects. And uh, that's really all I have, Councilman. So, okay. Thank you. And if you guys haven't been downtown lately, it's not just all the new development. Everybody's reinvesting. The uh, half shell is building out some canopies and some space outside because they're doing so much business. They're actually putting in some red brick. Am I correct? Yes, that, um, yeah, red brick pavers, which will match our Howard Avenue. It's, it's going to look really good. And then Martinis has got to build out. I went down there and talked to a lot of the, the owners and, and developers, and they're doing so much by way of renovation that that isn't even on his list yet. Um, now, you know, I didn't talk about much of, of the, the light situation in the ward and the city. And I know Mr. Lee and I spoke about it outside and I spoke with, 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 with Ms. Bell about it. And we're looking to partner with Mississippi Power on redoing these lights, which helps us save capital to put in other areas. But when I, when I talked to our rep from Mississippi Power this afternoon, he told me that he's gone through and he's got a build out for all these lights to convert them to LED, which of course will give us more more uh, lumens, increased lumens, and less cost. But we just can't get materials. We can't get supplies. They're so far behind. And one thing they're, they're concerned about, about another storm hitting, so they're stockpiling a little bit to prevent um, emergency situations, but we're just not getting the parts and the pieces in. So it's taking a little bit longer than they expected and we hoped. Um, I'm gonna move it over from lights to the streets and, and introduce uh, Assistant Chief back he's going to tell you about what's going on in our ward with regard to crime statistics thank you councilman good evening everybody so the report that everybody uh, picked up by the door that's our uh, the report for the last 90 days and over that 90 day period uh, we took 745 calls for service uh, resulted in 72 incidents of a total of 100 uh, different offenses and made 36 arrests. Um, the ward's actually looking pretty good. If, if, you, if you look at uh, things like burglaries, um, from this time last year, if you look at the numbers last year, there were, there were seven burglaries reported this year in the last 90 days, 26 last year, which is a 73% de decrease. And then thefts went down 30%. So there's a lot of good things happening. Um, if you look at that map to the, on the right side, you see the kind of cloudy areas. Um, a lot of that can be attributed to uh, extra patrols, um, traffic stops, and so forth. That cloudiness is what that, that represents, the things like that. Um, so more officers in the area. Uh, as far as what we have coming up, we've, we just got through a, a busy season with Mardi Gras and different 5Ks, uh, which keeps us real busy. Uh, the next two months it kind of drops off a little bit, but we do have spring break coming up. So spring break will be the uh, 9th, 10th, and 11th of April. Um, what we're seeing right now, there's no real organizer, but what we're seeing right now is, is they, they have rented the parking lot at the uh, Coliseum. Um, there have been some events, usually those events are in that general area or even um, some of the clubs and stuff in the East Biloxi. Uh, we also received word that the, the drag strip over in Long Beach area, they've rented that as well as Jones Park and Gulfport. So hopefully that'll help spread out our, our uh, cluster of traffic a little bit, uh, like in other events like cruising and, and so forth. Um, I, you know, of course, in any event, our main goal is to keep the flow of traffic going and keep people safe. Um, as far as the, that first page, that comes from our crime mapping program. Uh, we are switching over to a different program and we should be going live. Uh, Motorola uh, Flex is telling us in April. So we will have a different uh, link to that, crime mapping, if that's something you look at through the city website. As soon as we go live and get that going, it'll be published on the website, you'll have easy access. Um, to uh, help with that, those extra patrols and stuff. We're, we're certainly hiring officers and dispatchers right now. I want to throw that out there. Any of you zip liners are interested in being a, the police, you know. But, if, it, but seriously, if you do know somebody, um, tell them to, it, we're, we're, we're hiring. We're doing a monthly test for sworn officers. 
Uh, at the end of, what week is this? At the end of next week, we have a bunch of interviews for both dispatch and sworn officers and a few other spots in the department. But uh, the, the number of officers, what helps us do those extra patrols, traffic stops in the area, which helps re the reduction of crime. <laughs> Uh, next Tuesday, we're having our first uh, Citizens Academy graduate. That's a 10-week program. If anybody's interested, as soon as we get the next date, we'll be publicizing that. I encourage you to uh, uh, join it. Um, essentially, each week, it's, a, it's about three hours one, uh, every Tuesday, and you'll hear about every aspect of the police department. You'll learn about every, everything. And then at the end, there's a VIP program, it's a volunteer program. If you would want to join that, you're certainly welcome to once you complete the academy. But it's a lot of good information uh, that's, that's out there. Um, does anybody have any questions about the ward or crimes? Can you back? Yes. Just about every category, we've seen a reduction across the board, in, right? We have. What do you attribute that to? Greater patrol, efforts, better economy, what is? It, I think it's gonna be a little bit of everything. Um, you know, certainly when the economy's better, you see less crime, but like I said, there's, there's a lot, lot more uh, patrol activities, a lot more traffic stops. That all, you know, officer visibility helps bring down the crime level. More people calling in when they see some suspicious activity, that also helps. And then with our camera programs that are growing, um, it helps on the investigative side. So when something does happen, we're able to get uh, additional information in a timely manner, resolve the crime. Certainly when you put the burglar in jail, they're unable to commit more crimes. Yes, sir. I have a question regarding the cameras. Does the police department keep any type of statistics on how many crimes are solved related to cameras? You know, with neighbors who have cameras and they, what they actually do is share that information with the police department? I'm going to. Can you repeat the question? So what, what he's asking is, is there any statistics where that, that, we, sh that we keep that we can share that, that helps in, uh, in, solving your crime. in solving the crime rates? So I'm going to turn that question over to Captain Moran, who's actually over the program. <coughs> Hold on, sir. So we do, we do track stats is the short answer. Okay. And the long answer is every, every year the department prepares a, an annual report of every activity associated with the police department and all of its different divisions and sections within the department. And part of that is the crime camera program, the real time crime center, our license plate uh, reader program, which are the, the LPR cameras that you may have heard about. Um, in terms of uh, what type of benefit they provide to the community, the way we track our crime camera program in terms of success metrics would be things like how many cases that we've assisted with in a given period of time, and um, then the number fluctuates, and I don't know the number right off the top of my head, but it's usually in the last year was about 167 felony cases, give or take, um, directly benefited from our crime camera program. Now. Where we really made a difference last year is in the recovery of stolen property in terms of stolen cars and wanted persons from the tag cameras. Last year we recovered over a million dollars in stolen cars. Over a million dollars in stolen cars. Now, you know, we, we ask ourselves what benefit is that in terms of public safety? Really what, what that equates to, that's real dollars and cents to the community because that's your personal property that's being recovered. And so that's a big deal for us, that we can actually, in some way, take that government investment. And if you think in terms of return on investment, you know, for what we pay for our, our, our fees for our license plate uh, readers every year, to be able to turn that around and to equate that into a million dollar return in terms of recovered property, it's really, really good. Um, our crime cameras, it's an ever expanding program. We originally started in partnership with Project NOLA, uh, which was a public-private partnership uh, and a nonprofit. Uh, we have started to kind of pivot away to being a little more self-sufficient to where we can store our own data and manage our own. We do our own installations. We do our own configurations. But what we also do, we have partnered with a, a company called Fusis. Fusis is a virtual real-time crime center uh, service. But what they can provide you 
is a mechanism by which that you can share your your um, your surveillance cameras on your private property uh, and fully control yourself and you can designate what cameras you want to share with public safety uh, it's very low cost what we found was our original uh, paradigm of trying to get the community to partner with crime cameras the cost when we compared that with being able to it, essentially install a network video recorder um, on your on your property the cost was much much lower um, and it doesn't uh, cost you any more it doesn't cost you a service fee it's a one-time fee right now I think the price points all the way down to about two hundred dollars for a small network video recorder that will allow you to share your video directly with the police department um, at times when you decide you want to you have complete control over your systems so those are the types of things that, that we're, we're trying to really expand our capabilities, trying to, to maximize uh, your investment, because that's what we're talking about, it's your, your tax dollars. We're trying to get that money reinvested to get you a better return on investment. I was just, just to tell you what you just said, many people now utilize the ring. How does your ring uh, <clears throat> camera fit in and, and actually uh, integrate with it, it, it can and so it, it does it in a different aspect so with all of these different companies it's not just ring you have nest you have uh, blink you have all of these all of these uh, services in your home now they all have their own types of applications that will allow you to share any one of those video clips with really anyone you can post it to uh, social media a lot of them have their own social media groups I know ring and blink partner with um, I think they partner with Nest for the neighborhood app, I believe, yeah. if you've ever used that. Yes. The law enforcement neighborhood app. Yeah, and there's, there's also the law enforcement neighborhood app with Ring itself. But all of these are different platforms that provide you the ability to share that data with not only your neighbors, but also public safety directly. Okay. Sir? Not at all, okay. not at all. With the with the uh, the fuses, what they call it, it's a core, and on the table I've got some cards over there. If you want to grab one, it, you can go to the website and, and read up on it. Essentially, it's a, a core appliance. You in, you put that in your network, you plug it into your camera server or your switch at the house or your modem, and then they will configure it for you remotely. You tell them what you want the police department to be able to see and not see. So think of it in terms of you know, a lot of people have their surveillance cameras both maybe inside and outside. We don't want to see what's going on in your backyard, you know, at your pool. We don't want to see your patio where you're going to have dinner at night. What we're interested in is that data of your driveway, your front yard, where you're capturing the, the roadways, the public access spaces in front, in front of your properties. Because it's not necessarily for your personal protection, which it does enhance, but it's also about your community awareness, whereas your neighbor gets their car burglarized and you may have caught, captured the person on video transiting back and forth in front of your house and in most cases that's where um, the police really get uh, the benefit of those surveillance systems is in those cameras that are in the area not necessarily at the scene of the crime and um, you know you really become a force multiplier for your neighborhood and um, you know communicate that buy-in and try to get the neighborhood involved Uh, we have, they're not, generally they're kind of all over the place. Um, we have them coming into the city. We have them at various high traffic areas. Um, you know, they're, they're not hidden. You can simply look up at the, at the traffic signals and a lot of times you'll see a camera there. Yeah. Well, all the, all, all the ones on Highway 90 are going to be MDOT cameras. And um, at right now, those aren't recorded. Um, but to kind of touch on what Cap Moran, Moran was saying, so like going back to ring doorbell cameras, um, the app, that, the law enforcement app, we are part of that. So one of the things we can do is push out, push out messages to individual communities and so forth uh, if need be. Or you can communicate with us through that. Um, but, and then also with the FUSIS, 
uh, let's say you don't want us to have access, you can still sign up. That way we know, hey, you have a camera in the general area where your cameras are, and then we contact you if you don't want us to have access to the camera. So there are several different options. But most of my career I spent in investigations. And early on, you, you pretty much just had the business cameras. You had a few residences here and there. Um, I can tell you from working with Intel, support from Intel, and, and the cameras that came along, and uh, my last job before assistant chief was major over investigations. It has helped tremendously in identifying the, the suspect, like, like Captain Moran said, it might be your neighbor's house that catches the person running away. But we always put out, we get the video, sometimes you see it and it like, looks like the, uh, the abominable snowman running away. And sometimes it's a good picture, but it's, it's what we get. But we try to put that out in every attempt to identify the perpetrator. Um, I can tell you that our resolvability rate's gone, gone up tremendously. Um, in property crimes nationally, it's about 12% that property crimes actually get resolved, and we're, we're hovering around the high 20s to 30%. And then a lot of it's because, whether it's community support or the, the camera program, that we're able to identify the person that did it or recover the property. Um, sir, I think you had a question. So his question was about um, uh, the abundance or increasing activity of juveniles in the Sharon Hills area uh, riding motorcycles. So um, that's something that we can put in for extra patrol. I can tell you between motorcycles and golf carts, we have seen an increase in, in, in stops on kids in, um, I say North Biloxi, but what it used to be North Biloxi, the Sharon Hills area and so forth. So that, that is being addressed, but, uh, but I'll bring it to the patrol commander again so we can have additional enforcement just for that, because you're right, it has become a problem. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's it. He has a. We have a. Uh, if I we have a graduating class coming up in reference Citizens Academy, that it that is the Citizens Academy. They actually finished tonight. I mean uh, this past Tuesday, but we had to move the graduation till next Tuesday. You have a CAP program. Uh, I'm sorry. We do not, but I'd be interested in hearing about it. Um, before I leave tonight, I'll give you my information so you can give me that. Yes, sir. Since we're on the subject of motorcycles and golf carts, uh, in the Sun Desk uh, Country Club area, uh, half of these carts aren't, don't have permits. You've got children uh, under the age of 14 with no driver's license running around. These carts now do more than 40 miles an hour, and they're doing every bit of that. There's been several code closed calls where these kids have almost been killed. And it's no different than the rebar fencing for modern world. It's an accident waiting to happen. Well, yep. these kids are going to get hit, and it's coming. We can either be proactive and do something about it, or we can wait until one of them's dead. Yes, sir. And, and what we're trying to do is be proactive with that to uh, push our program out so that they are following all the guidelines and rules just like everybody else is supposed to. Um, the, uh, like I said, we have issued several citations. Uh, that's not a cheap citation either. And it's the, the fine is for every event. So like if you're unregistered, if you're unlicensed, if you're uninsured, that's three different citations. Um, but it is something that we're trying to focus on because there are a lot out there. It is a relatively new program. It's only been around for about a year now. So we got to make sure everybody knows about it, and the ones that don't want to follow the rules, cite them, get them to follow the rules. And those LED light bars that they're using for off-road use on these golf 
Yes, sir. 7,000, 10,000 lumens, they're not street legal. They're for off-road use only. I understand your concern, sir. Yes, ma'am. So if it's so bizarre. It's like a racetrack. Well, I wanted to say I was coming back from the south side of the bridge about um, between six thirty, six and six thirty on like Saturday, and um, I could see I could not get the Madison Road onto Fox Ferry. And I thought, oh gee, you know, well maybe the spans up. No. <laughs> so I waited and then I heard Sarah. Thank you. I'm sorry to hear that. No, that's okay. That's okay. I've lived there a long time, and I'm pretty good at being able to get out of the driveway. Well, I can I tell you. Thank you. I would, well, we appreciate it. But I can tell you, if you look at the cloud that the in the center there along Potts Ferry, where it's kind of red, yeah. that that's usually generally due to uh, additional traffic. So. Yeah. It is a raceway. We are aware of it, and it's an area that we're trying to monitor and slow people down. Yeah, you do a good job, but it's just crazy people the way they drive. Oh, I agree. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Yes, ma'am.
Well, you're, you're already doing the first step, and that's the petition. But first of all, I noted down the, the location. So the, what the, pro, the way the process is, is we have a traffic committee. And uh, what we do at the department is we'll put it on a list for additional traffic control up there in the meantime. Um, hopefully slow some people down, issue some citations when needed. But we bring issues just like that to the traffic committee and, and don't just throw up um, speed bumps or signs or whatever it is, change speed limit, whatever it is. We, we On the traffic committee you have uh, uh, people from community development, you have engineers, you have us and so forth. And we all talk about the different issue and try to figure out what the best way, the best approach is. Just throwing out speed bumps, you know, you have the first step going, the petition. That's one of the things w that we would ask for. Um, because by the time you, you put the speed bumps in, which is not very cheap, and it's, what was that said, like $10,000? There was a set we put out that was around $10,000, and a month later we had to pull them up because most of the people in the neighborhood didn't want them. So we asked for that petition first. And then, um, but, one of the other things is you have, you know, the possibility of damage to cars, and those are all things that we have to take into consideration. Well, their transmissions to fall out. Certainly, <laughs> but it's not, it's not damage to their cars. It's it, when you're going, when you're leaving through the neighborhood, it might be damage to your car. So the, those are the things that we have to take into consideration. But, um, and then we can't just put anything in the middle of the street. So I understand that, but I'm just sure. Well, and I'm not asking for a mountain. Sure, sure. You know what I'm saying? I'm just saying some of the slow these people down. They're just, I've been there 22 years, and it's just like the end of 500. Well, you've absolutely, you've absolutely got the process started with that petition. And then, and then I've got it on the list so I can add it to our uh, extra patrol. I'll add it to our um, so meeting for, for, I'm sorry. You, you either do that or you, you can send it to me. Um, but we'll have that traffic committee. We'll discuss it more. I'll have it on the list for that um, and look at different alternatives, what we, can, what we can do to slow people down in that area. But that, that's the general process. If you have a, a speeding issue in your neighborhood, bring it to us. We'll get started on law enforcement from the, uh, the citation route, and then, and then we'll go further and see what else we need to do for that area. Is there any other? Yes, ma'am. Um, so, I live across the street from this area. Um, some days it takes me like 10 minutes to get to turn left onto Fox Ferry. Um, the new dividers, the pole things that were put up um, on that turning lane are, um, in my opinion, horrible because someday an uh, accident is going to happen because a lot of drivers aren't paying attention and they're And you're talking about the poles on Pops Ferry. Yeah, the poles on Pops Ferry. I stay in the corner house right there on Pops Ferry. Um, another thing, is there anything in the budget to put signs up to direct people to the dog park because my driveway is on a turn <laughs> So, So as far as signs, that, that's an easy fix. Okay. Um, so signs to dog park. And they're using your driveway to turn around. Yes. And knocking down mailboxes. Yes. We had to, we literally had to move our mailbox from the house area on the front street. And like the guard there that's in the yard right now, thank goodness no one has hit it since it's been put up. But the traffic right there, like Ms. Carolyn said, is completely horrible. Like okay. And was that intersection again? Hawks Ferry and North Country Club. By the dog park, I don't know. I'm across the street, and those those lights are sometimes. Okay, as far as like as far as the light, that's another thing I had to bring to the traffic committee. But the signs, I can take care of that. Okay. It's where the dog park is. My yep. house is a two-story house. Mm -hmm. It's next to the walking track and the Margaret Sherry Library. 
history. Yes, ma'am. I got it on my list and I'll, I'll bring that forward. Um, any other issues? Question? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Councilman is going to address that when he comes back up. Yes, sir. One thing, so that nobody will misunderstand, there was a reference made to the cameras and tickets. Okay, so we do not give tickets based on cameras. I know you've seen in Ocean Springs where they're doing the no insurance tickets. We have no tickets given out due to cameras. Those are strictly, we have a few uh, tag readers, uh, like Captain Moran said, most of them are on, you know, around the entrance exit to the, uh, the city. And then the rest of them, for the major, most of the part, are just regular cameras. The only thing we're getting off that camera is to resolve crimes. We're, you know, we're, we're not getting, oh, this guy looks like he's bidding, so we're going to send him a ticket. But um, now, turn around in uh, driveways, we might start doing that. You know, so. But I appreciate your time. Um, if you have any other questions, just come see me. Um, sir, I'll get with you uh, as far as that program. Thank you, Chief. Well, that was great. It's, that's tough to follow. Uh, but I, I do want to say, with regard to the, the bikes, the motorbikes, and, and the um, golf carts, I'm going to ask the administration to support me on sending out at least a mailer and to put posting on the B-mail an update to the parents in those neighborhoods to, to let them know what the laws and what the punishment or the sanctions are for violating those rules. I think that we, we need to have um, better disseminated information for these issues. We pass these rules and it's kind of confusing because they don't know how to play the game. Um, speed bumps, uh, just to clarify, there really isn't a budget for speed bumps, but it's in our road and paving budgets if we want to put them in there. So we're, we're actually, um, I've got the bids out right now for the paving on Ravenwood Laurelwood. We've got the contractor correcting the, the curbs and stuff like that. Once they're done, we will be uh, resurfacing those roads and we'll talk, talk to the administration about that and get the traffic committee involved with regard to how we address the, the, the um, excessive speeding in that area. Uh, you're welcome. Now, um, the bridge, just jump on that real quick. We did touch it before you walked in. The, the toll bridge uh, proposal's dead. It was killed. The, the, the mayor um, is going gonna, is gonna to opt. All right. Good enough. <laughs> enough said. All right. So, uh, the last of the Mohicans, I've got uh, Nick Geyser, our new, our new uh, chief of the fire department. Um, this will be the first time he's, he's presented in front of our ward. So, Chief Geyser, if you would. All right, thank you. Good evening. Uh, two tough acts to follow. Those are the two sexy departments in, uh, in the city. They get to tell you about all the new development and all the fun, crime, and all that good stuff. Uh, you know, so essentially the fire department runs in the background until you need us. Um, you know, and, and unfortunately we come at, uh, you know, a bad time. Uh, so, but just to give you kind of a, an update on, on the department itself, um, we're doing really well um, on keeping our numbers. Uh, we we want to always improve them. Uh, we're always recruiting. Um, you know, we're kind of like uh, the police. We, uh, if you've got any children, grandchildren uh, that that don't that need a job, send them our way. We're uh, we're not as as active as the police. I think y'all are short. What probably 20, 22? They're probably twenty two short. We're about too short budget-wise. Now we are applying for a, uh, a grant right now. It's it's in the mix to get 15 more. Uh, if you remember back um, early 2000s when we were annexing uh, Wall Market and all that area, we were steadily hiring. We were hiring 15 firefighters at a time, and we were riding four to a truck, which really puts a safety factor. That's that's really the national standard. Is what you want to do. You go to a big city. You sometimes see four or five firefighters. Right now, we're running at three firefighters per truck, which we still can get the job done. Don't make, 
don't make any any worries about that. We still come, we're still going to show up, we're still going to do our job, and we can still put out a fire with the best of them. But the safety factor that that one extra man adds, because we go in as partners. We're, we're always two people in, two people out, or more. Um, so that's one thing that we're, uh, we're, we're seeking, another 15 firefighters. So right now we've got an active list with probably about eight. We'd like to keep an active list of about 15 to 20. That way, as people retire, we replace, and, and we're not caught in this situation. Um, let's see, uh, as far as our, our current firefighters, we have now made it a, uh, a requirement to, to keep your job when you first hire on with us. You, one, of course, have to become a basic firefighter and get through our 10-week training, which we do all in-house now. Um, we work with the, the State Fire Academy up in uh, Jackson, and they, they do the testing, but we do all the training ourselves. Uh, after they get done with that training, they can go to our trucks and they can do all the firefighting and, and the medical services. Um, but we also require them to be EMT basic certified, which means that they've got at least, uh, it's basically a, a semester class at Gulf Coast uh, right down the street. But we do that in-house also. We've got a partnership with Gulf Coast and the state uh, uh, health services. And they issue us a number and we are allowed to teach it because we have also increased our numbers on paramedics and nurses on the department. So we now have five to six full-time paramedics um, that, that run the trucks with these EMTs. We also have uh, two nurses with another one on the way. Um, you know, he's going through his training, doing his clinicals. So we have a, uh, a fully medical staff uh, at this point um, because, you know, our whole our whole department has, has transferred from firefighting and a little bit of rescue and a little bit of medical to now we do almost 85% of our calls are medical. And then it trickles down into our, our fires and our false alarms at casinos, our wrecks, which turns into a medical and, and you know, so on and so forth. So, um, and then we have our technical rescue, which is few and far between, but when those are called, you know, it's always a, uh, a, a a very extensive uh, bit of, uh, of stuff that we have to get together. Um, so um, a couple things we've got going on in, uh, in the department also, we've got three new trucks. As I said, back when we annexed Wall Market, that was around the late 90s, early 2000s. We had to buy trucks, we had to, we had to outfit stations uh, to, to cover those areas after the annex. The lifespan of a, of a fire truck is 20 years. We're, we're in 2022, we're getting to the end of the lifespan of those per the, uh, the standards that we, we have to follow. So we're buying three new trucks. In fact, that just got uh, approved this last council meeting uh, Tuesday. Uh, sitting in our pumper hall at Central is uh, our new uh, air packs, the SCBAs that we wear into fight fire. Uh, it's something we haven't really, we have not had new air packs in since I hired on and back in the early 2000s. We were running uh, uh, one air pack. When we had to upgrade, the chief at the time did, a, uh, did an upgrade, not a new pack change out. Um, and that's what we still currently have. So these packs are getting dated. Um, we worked with uh, our, our grant writer who used to be one of our, our fire department members. Uh, she did a fantastic job and wrote a grant. And this grant was uh, federally funded almost 90% of it was federally funded and it was over half a million dollars to get these air packs. So they are gonna be on the trucks next week. So we are really excited about that. Um, I've already talked about the, uh, the grant that, we, that she also wrote for us that we should hear sometime this summer about the 15 new firefighters. If we, uh, if we receive that grant, that is a fully 100% funded for three years. If we hire 15 firefighters, this grant pays for their their salary, their training, their, their gear, every piece of equipment except for the clothes that we put them in, it covers everything for a full three years and then the city picks up the tab once, once that's done. Um, so right down the street here, Station 5, uh, the Bay Vista Station, uh, as y'all all know, it's one of our oldest stations. Uh, we have preliminary plans and some drawings to update that station because uh, now it, it happens to be the most busy station. Um, you know, since Katrina, a lot of population has moved off the east end of town because the houses weren't there. Now this is the busy area. Um, so 
we have placed another another engine at that station been running it for probably about five to seven years as a two engine station to cover all the medical calls that we we have out in this area um, well they're they're filled to the max we we have six guys we have three per truck that run out of that station if we get these 15 firefighters right now i won't be able to put a fourth person on the truck because we don't even have a bed or a room to put them in um, or or even a table and chairs to put them at for for that many um, so we're hoping to get that expansion in this next budget year uh, especially with the uh, with the increased revenue that we're seeing um, we're, we're hoping that that will help pay for that so hopefully y'all see some some good stuff happening there uh, let's see um, I already spoke about the uh, the training of our personnel each firefighter that comes on goes through about 20 to 22 weeks of training between the the firefighter basic and the EMT um, we've we've cut it down to where the the firefighter will get firefighter trained then we put them on the truck so they can get off of the eight hour day and they can start working on a truck and start filling some some shifts and then we've worked it out with the state where they allow us to teach the EMT basic course we, we we've had to be redundant so essentially we are teaching the same subject Monday Tuesday Wednesday so each person is able to do its shift work and not have to come off or we have to pay overtime to cover that so we've reduced costs there um, let's see um, recently we've just reopened our, our stations back to the public uh, so anytime y'all want to stop in just chit chat with the with the crews uh, do a station tour uh, you know we had to shut them down with COVID and trying to keep our numbers uh, up because it was it was getting at one point uh, in the early part of COVID in that March April time frame uh, we, we have 160 guys on the truck we had 25 out um at any time in about a month and a half it was running between about 23 to 25 because of covid numbers and it was outbreaks at station if station five right here had one pretty much the whole thing went down and we had to backfill and we had to call people in so um you know anyway now that numbers that are getting better by all means y'all come by and visit the guys they'll be more than happy to show you around and, and chit chat and Y'all can tell them, hey, you know, this is this is an area you need to watch. We've got possibly homeless population that are burning uh, campfires in the back, and we can always run by and we can relay it. We work with the police really well um, in getting that kind of stamped out and, and under control. Um, let's see. I've already covered the uh, the basic EMT and all that is done in house. Uh, a couple other things that we're doing for our recruitment effort, we're trying to use. Um, we're trying to use our, our ability to reach out to the, to the young people in the community, especially high schoolers or college age uh, kids that, look, I went to college and I didn't know what I wanted to do the first couple years I was there, 18, 19, 20. Um, we're trying to give these kids some direction. Um, you know, it's, it's a great career, uh, police uh, included. Um, but we are working with the schools now, uh, we've, we've, and it's a, in, in its infancy, but we are, uh, we are, we're in contact with Biloxi Superintendent Marcus Boudreau and, and trying to get in the vocational uh, section where we can actually send our firefighters to the schools, to Biloxi High, get into a program, and then eventually what we're looking at is actually having EMT taught that last semester of senior year. And these, these kids can actually come in, learn it, and, and look, they don't have to come to us they'll still have a career right out the gate and they will be able to go work for AMR or Acadian over in Jackson County. So that's another thing that we're looking at, um, at doing. Um, other than that, just a little bit about myself. I am um, Biloxi born and raised, uh, lived right, grew up on Greenwood Drive, right in Tanglewood subdivision. Um, you know, mom and dad still live right there off Atkinson Road. And in fact, I was there right before I came here and dropped off our new puppy that's uh, going to be kind of the the fire dog he's he's the family dog but he's going to be uh his name's blaze so y'all will probably if y'all follow uh biloxi fire on facebook he'll be uh cecilia has already taken some pictures and he's 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 learning right now so we he's not making public appearances um other than that i went to southern myths you know and uh wife three kids um you know background is uh started fire department in 2004 so enjoying it and having fun does anybody have any questions for them? 
Well, I started there, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. My, my father uh, was one of the owners of Biloxi Lumber, if you all remember that one on Back Bay before it shut down in 2016. Um, and he is still doing, uh, you know, side work and all that, but just semi-retired, I guess you'd say. <laughs> all right. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And I miss it. <laughs> it's, <laughs> yes, ma'am. It's still one and two Yes, ma'am. One day on, two days off. So, you know, it's it's a it's it's an easy sell once you get uh once you get people to understand that um you know, a lot of these young young guys and young women you go to and they're like, Man, I'm not running in a burning building. And I have to reiterate to them, look, when I was on the trucks, the last burning building I went in was really five years ago. And I was going in with some of my good buddies. So I was okay, you know. It's not uh, a one a one man operation. So and I was gonna say I was Nick and Robert Lemming's health coordinator and nurse for Biloxi Schools, and I'm very, very proud of them. Yes, ma'am, thank you. <laughs> Hi, baby. Yeah. <laughs> yes, ma'am, did you? Yeah. So we, as far as the Lexi fire department mm -hmm. and the police. So we have, uh, fire department wise, we did have a uh, basically a citizen ride along program. And a lot of times, the way, I mean, anybody here is welcome, but a lot of times it was a, a young perspective. Yeah, I'm talking about probably young, younger Yes. Well, almost. Okay. Yes, ma'am. And I'll keep that in mind. I'll make a note and, uh, and see, because our prevention division pretty much handles that. They do a kids' academy during the summer. That might be something we can, uh, we can add additionally. Well, I, I retired from the city of Biloxi. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I have to start, start the summer program. The program. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. We might have to get you back, huh? <laughs> Come out of retirement. <laughs> All right. Thank you all. And that, they do run a great program. I actually was over there watching their, um, what, do you, what do you call that? It starts with an E, the, the, the controlled burn training things you were doing today? Evolutions. Evolutions. I would never know that, that they're called that, but, but a great staff. I toured a couple of the uh, firehouses and talked to all the firemen, and it, I'd be hard-pressed to find anybody else that bleeds Biloxi more than they do. But uh, we, we identified some, some shortcomings and some things we can do in the future to make the, the program better, but it is. It's, it's run very well, great leadership. People are happy and, and uh, looking forward to what we're doing in the future as we continue to improve pay rates and, and, um, and uh, benefits for, for our employees. Now, I want to get to um, some comments. I want, I want to remind you, when I spoke at the beginning of the meeting, I said that I, give me one second and I'll be right with you first, that I, I was going through my checklist and followed up and saw a lot of things that during the, the campaign hadn't been done yet, like Carol Lee Circle, your drainage, it's still on the list, if you guys want to get with me. I want, I want it to be more than just well, the list. Well, th they've been out there numerous times. And Listen, well, I, I have put out hard money this last year for so much rain. I shouldn't have said they've, you're on those, they've, they've been out to Carolee a few times, and so I want to follow up and make sure that they take some action. We've had a couple proposals, a couple different things that have come across the table for the drainage behind your home. We actually, I think we talked with Jerry's office about some of the fencing that was blocking access. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's been a lot of, there's been a lot of action. Our government takes a long time, and I apologize for that, but we're, we are. I, I, I do understand that, and, and like I said, we are going to, and I've got that, the lot, the dumping on the lot over there at Beauchene and uh, Rue Maison. A lot of those areas, the drainage between um, North Country Club Road and I think it's Rosewood coming out of Club, the Club Moss area, the, the paving and the, and the drainage at, at, at uh, Club Moss Circle on the back end. And there's a lot of issues that we have, the drainage behind um, the oaks the wetlands oaks. So I was going through these lists and, and reminding myself 
of, of the issues when I walked the, the area and I looked at all of the, the work orders and saw which ones were completed and which ones hadn't been completed. And so we're going to go through all those again with Public Works to make sure that they get addressed. Um, like I promised, I'll start with you. Yeah, well, since our last, since the last meeting we had six months ago, I have sent you ten different texts, and you have not been, you have not had the integrity to answer me once. Which text? What number are you texting? Well, you, you know what? You've been reading. Somebody's been reading. <laughs> and uh, somebody's been reading. You're not doing anything about it. Which? What's the question? What's the issue? Well, the issue is this. Which gentleman are you talking about? This, this would be Dwight Johnson. Well, okay. we've Dwight Johnson. I have spoken. I haven't. We. You, well, you, you need to clue him in because he, he's not able to tell me that he's talked to you. Well, I think. Okay. Now the last thing he said when he talked to me was he said that engineering told him that we can't be tracing through people's people's property with uh, without permission. Okay. That was the same answer we got six months ago, and still nothing was done. Well, now so we're 60 days out from hurricane season, or probably even less than that. So I've, like I, I mentioned this at the beginning of the meeting. That that area, there's a catch basin area, and so I have had uh, um, Leonard, Mike Leonard, the CAO, has dispatched his engineers out there, and we do think we've identified something that will help the water run out of that catch basin, which will reduce the water um, accumulating on those roads and in that area. So that is something we are doing and we're doing it actively. So it's not that this isn't. This is a drain before this is the cash basin. I've identified 15 houses that are not draining. What, what's your address number? 2275, you should have it memorized by now. And this is behind your house? Behind my house. Concrete is, okay now I finally got a hold of Stella and engineering has put it with somebody over here in, uh, in, in, in roads and whatever, whatever department it's in. And now they're waiting for somebody that is a construction person to go out and identify it and tell them how much it's going to cost. Now, and then they're probably going to farm it out to the city. Guys, this has been five years. I talked to another guy up on, up on Wildwood Trace this has been going on. He's got a letter that's dated 2001. Okay. And, and you got plenty of money. You already said you got plenty of money. I, I don't know that I've, I don't know, I've never said we got plenty of money. I, all I'm saying it's never been said. You need to be polite enough to at least get back in touch with me when I ask you to request. Yes, sir. I apologize. And I'll make sure that I do better. I will. I, will. I do apologize. And there's uh, this man that just left. Sewer coming up over his over his uh, sidewalk, and that would be right up in the. I don't know what his address is, but it's right up in the turn up there. He's on Club Moss also. On Club Moss, or, yeah, south side to the south, the south part of Club Moss. And then the, there's another thing that is on Club Moss Circle between Cherry Lane and where this guy lives. You cleaned out one lot. He cleaned out the back of his place, and it cost him four thousand dollars to remove those trees. And at the time that they were removing the trees, this this tree man was saying that he is he is working on trying to get those trees out through there. And 
and there's uh, one house out at the end and one house at the other end. But I have counted, I've, I've counted 15 houses that really have bad drain problems. They can't even use our, they can't use the front yards or the back yards. It really depends on whether or not the city has an easement that runs through there. Is that a city easement, sir? Do you know? Yeah. If that is an actual city easement for drainage through there? It's, it's that, that would be the drain. That, that is, that's the drain. Because okay. it goes well, underneath the street. Yes, sir. What, uh, what the gentleman was referring to is that the city doesn't have the right to go into private property unless we have a drainage easement on there. So what we can do is check on that to see if there is actually a, an easement back there. All right, I'll get, I'll get Carrie to give me maps of that whole area, and then I'll meet with you, and we'll figure that out. And then there have been two more houses that have put foundations in, and it looks like uh, and nobody is, no, nobody's blocking off that dirt from, from going in that drain. Okay, we take care of that in our department, and if we, if we get a report that there's red dirt running into the drain, yeah. I'll have somebody out there tomorrow if you can just give me a, an address or, or what address that's close to? You can't miss it. Come to 2275. Okay. Club, Club Malls. Keep going with East. East. 20, East. Is that Club Mall, sir? Club Mall, yeah. sir. Yeah. Right. There's two houses and two houses of foundation, brand new foundations. Okay. And it's running off in the drain. Developments that we have coming right now, there there hasn't been any uh, specificity given to this is going to be a 55 plus community. Uh, most of them are just building houses, and they have them in different affordability ranges. Now, uh, certainly, I'm sure that they will cater to anyone that can come in there that's eligible to to buy those. And a lot of these companies like Horton Homes and DSLD and those kind. Uh, they have their own financing companies. I mean, they will work with people to, to uh, either uh, modify the house to meet your income eligibility requirements, you know, so, so they do work with you in that capacity. Now, the difference in a, uh, a standard subdivision and a, a gated community, and we get asked this question all the time, you know, we've, we've decided that we'd like to be a gated community. We don't want all this traffic coming through here. Well, it, it sounds good on paper, but, but when it comes right down to it, what does that mean? That means that from that point forward, you're going to have to assume the repair and maintenance on everything in that subdivision, the roads, the sewer, the water, everything in there. Because once that gate goes across to a, what used to be a public road, as long as it's a public road, then anybody in the public has the right to use it. And, you know, any, any taxpayer has the right to use it. But whenever you declare it a, a gated community or a private road and you block it off, even the garbage trucks can't go through there. So uh, it, it sounds good on one side, but what you're giving up a lot of times is, is not going to be affordable for the people that live in that development. But there, there are a number of subdivisions, <clears throat> and I just said gated. there are some that are gated, but there are a number of subdivisions mm -hmm. that have 55 plus. And Mm -hmm. And that's all. And that, I was just asking that question. Yeah. If any of the developers had considered that. Right, right now, well, certainly we're open to it, yes, and, and a lot of our zoning would allow developments that are like that. So everything that we've done from a city standpoint 
is, is open for that type of development. We just haven't had a developer come to us and say, I want to do this and I want it to specifically be for 55 and older. And if they, and if they do, I may be one of the first in line to... Uh, and let me ask you a final question. The city seems to appear to be moving forward with progress. Mm -hmm. I moved here in 2004. They talked about the Potts Ferry River Bridge. Mm -hmm. They've been talking about it for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I'll be here almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. What time span are they going to put on it to try to do something about that bridge? Okay. Well, it's all, okay. about, it's all about money. I mean, it, it's all well, about money. Let me, let me say this. There. Coming from another state, mm -hmm. I've watched engineers, and I know, and I know it's more than money. It's mm -hmm. something else behind that. Yeah. You know, it's it's who who has the money, who's going to get the contracts, mm -hmm. and who's going to be able to build it. If you get a tollway in, you got private money mm -hmm. comes in, they build it, mm -hmm. and they will build it. Mm -hmm. They'll build it like this, mm -hmm. not not a, not five, six, seven, eight years, mm -hmm. but they can do it within a couple of years. Yeah. And then you pay for it. You yeah. have to pay the group. Dollars. Yeah, the group the that came is, in. The yeah. group. And, the, I, and I'm not promoting yeah, that. Well, I'm either way. Yeah, the group. That, the group that came in said that they could have the bridge open and running in four years, if the city would agree to it. The mayor did research and and listened to people and decided that that was not the way that we wanted to go right now. So, so it it'll was, be another twenty years. I'll be yeah. dead. It, and, and let me just say this, you know, as far as contractors and that kind of thing, if there's any other reason other than money, I don't know anything about it because it has always been about money as far as I've known. And, and the, not only, you know, we had a, a figure one time of like $75 million, and that has gone up now with the cost of everything else going up. Now, I do know that there's supposed to be a meeting with some council members and uh, the Southern District Highway Commissioner, I was informed of that today, to talk about that very thing, the bridge. And so. the reason why I say that is that that's a main thoroughfare for hurricanes. Not, but everything else that goes on down here. Not, and, I agree with and, you. And, and it just, it just yeah. doesn't, something just doesn't click. Well, the, let me just tell you, the mayor's long range, long range vision is to have a connector that runs all the way from Highway 90 all the way up and ties in with Highway 67. Because if you think about it, and, and we did a presentation before uh, the mayor became mayor uh, about some things that would help economic development work in the city. And if you think about it, off of New Highway 67, you've got two connectors that come down in this direction to the south. You've got 605 that comes down into Gulfport, and then you have uh, 67 that continues on down and becomes I-110, where you go through D'Iberville before you get to the east end of Biloxi. So in order to help stimulate central Biloxi again, you know, we had a lot of businesses that were suffering, you know, because, you know, you either had to come this direction and then turn this way or go this direction and turn back this way, even to get to the Coliseum and major events like that. We need to have that connector that comes right off of 67 and comes all the way, right down through the heart of the city, all the way down to Highway 90. And we're working on the first leg of that right now with the Pops Ferry extension down to Highway 90. So, okay. thank you. Thank you, Jerry. One thing that one thing that Pops Ferry extension down to Highway 90 does too is it it ties it into Highway 90, which makes it a state road, and that state road will give us the access to, to greater fi funding and financing for future projects on that road. Uh, I would like to see uh, a bridge like the Ocean Springs Bridge that don't have to be open and closed for folks to go in and out. Well, that that's our goal. That, That is that is the goal, the intent. I don't know how many wrecks a day uh, a police department can verify that on the I one ten bridge. I don't know what's happened lately, but it seems like we're having more wrecks on the I one ten bridge than we had previously, and I don't know what's caused the same. Yes, ma'am. Would that consume in the flood zone? 
No. No, no the, X, the, the X means that you're actually outside the flood zone. Uh, there, there's different categories for flood zones. Of course, you've got the velocity zone, which is the most intense. And, and then we have what's called a coastal A in the city. And the, the, the difference between flood zones is, is that if you're in the velocity zone or you're in coastal A, that's where you have rising water with current behind it. Uh, water that's rising and the surge is pushing that water. Those are the most intensive areas, and that's where you're going to be more subject to, to getting damage with your home. In the A zone, the standard A zone, or, or if it shows AE on the map, what that means is that you just are dealing with rising and falling water, that there is no current behind it. But once you get into an X zone or an SX zone, that means that you're outside the flood zone. Now, let me mention this uh, real, real quick because we talked about our flood rating. Um, the flood insurance program, which is a program that uh, has lost money ever since it was established, is going to a new form of technology to determine flood risk. You know, they're all about flood risk. And uh, what they're doing, at, at previously the way that a structure or a property was evaluated, the house was either inside or outside the flood zone. And in addition to that, it was either in compliance or out of compliance with the flood regulations. So if you've got a house that's inside the flood zone and it's out of compliance, it doesn't meet the elevation requirements or whatever, for some reason it's out of compliance, that's where you're gonna get the hardest hit on your flood insurance premiums because you're out of compliance. What's happening is they're gonna be using satellite technology to look at each individual structure so it wouldn't matter what zone you're in. They will look at each individual structure and they will evaluate the flood risk based on is it on a slab, is it elevated, is it close to the water, is it away from the water. So all of these kind of factors are going to start determining it and you may either see an increase or a decrease in your flood insurance as a result of this. We don't have any control over this. This is new technology that they're using. They're, they call the shots for the way it is and then they tell the city, here's what you're gonna be evaluated on from now on. So uh, you may see some changes in your flood insurance premiums up or down as a result of this new technology. When will the new technology take place? They're already using it and we're already getting some calls about it. Uh, it will probably happen whenever your renewal on your, in, your flood insurance comes up. Uh, you might see a change in it. And if you have any questions about that, if you, if you get the bill in and it's, it's higher or lower, whatever, if you want to call our office, uh, Rick Stickler is our floodplain manager. That's handled out of our department. And we'll uh, do everything we can to get you an answer about why it changed. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Okay, FEMA, FEMA does not control the flood rates. FEMA does the maps and FEMA uh, enforces other parts of, uh, of uh, the flood. Now, if you call FEMA and tell them, look, I really don't like the elevation y'all have given me or, or uh, I don't agree with this regulation, they'll tell you, well, wait, that's not our ordinance. That ordinance it belongs to the city of Biloxi. So what happens is, is that we're, we're kind of in a situation where we don't have to adopt that ordinance if we don't want to. But if we don't adopt it, then we can't provide flood insurance for the people that live here. So we're essentially forced to adopt that ordinance. Um, we deal with FEMA every day. We used to see them once every five years when they would come for what they call the, the community assistance visit. But now it's almost every day that we're dealing with FEMA and also with MEMA, you know, which is Mississippi Emergency Management. But the flood insurance is doled out by a federal program called the National Flood Insurance Program. And it was initiated by insurance companies that wanted to put some regulations in place for cities to comply with to reduce the risk of damage in the, when we have these situations, we have these major events. So it's controlled essentially by the insurance industry. And the more things that we do, the more activities that the city takes on to reduce flood risk, like cleaning out ditches, and doing those other things, the more points we get, and the more points we get, the better our rating is. Now, essentially, 
if, if in a perfect world, our rating would go down to a one, which means that everybody who has a flood insurance policy in the flood zone would get a 50% discount on their, their flood insurance policy. It takes every department working together to make that happen. It's not just our department. We depend on engineering. We depend on public service. We even depend on these guys over here to help us because there are so many activities that contribute to that rating that we get. So that's, that's one of the things that I talked with the, the fire department about today, and I know he mentioned that he was he was too short, and and that means like too short, not like me too short. He um, he, he, he he's too short. Um, but they told me that we needed probably another 16 to get us down to a one, which would be the best rating for insurance purposes that we could get to. And I think that program you were talking about will help us get there if we can utilize that. Um, do we have any more questions? Yes, well, thank you for coming. Yep. I'm sorry. I just haven't met her on the site. I sent you an email uh, this week okay. about an issue uh, that deals with the bulkhead that the city replaced about five years ago on the property. I think Art Wellis Marine replaced it. The uh, fire department bled the fire hydrant there, mm -hmm. washed out the bulkhead, so the city took responsibility and replaced it. runs parallel to South Shore Drive in Biloxi. The base of that vertical pole, three of those have cracked. And it's bowing out. If that falls into that canal, it's going to affect South Shore Drive. I mean, yeah. road and all can fall. Will you Is there anything else? Well, thank you again for coming. We'll see you in a couple months.